Hello everyone and welcome! No, you did not miss a Twitch stream. This is me finishing up the book as fast as I can by reading it to you here on YouTube. So thank you so much for being here and I hope you will enjoy me reading this. So we're just gonna jump right on in. Chapter 14, which is full of kobolds again. Carmen was still thinking of Calcifer when she got up the next morning. As she came out of the bathroom, she saw that Peter was busily engaged in changing the sheets on Great Uncle William's bed and stuffing the old sheets into a laundry bag. Carmen sighed. More work. Still, she said to Waif as she put down the usual bowl of dog food, he keeps him busy and happy while I look for Calcifer. Now, are you coming up to those rocks with me? Waif always was only too pleased to go wherever Carmen went. After breakfast, she trotted eagerly after Carmen through the living room to the front door, but they never went to the rocks. As Carmen put out her hand to the door knob, Waif charged out from behind her and burst the door open. And there was Rollo on the doorstep in the act of reaching his small blue hand out for his daily crock of milk. Uttering teeny snarls, Waif sprung upon him, got her jaws round Rollo's neck and pinned him to the ground. Peter! Carmen roared. Come quickly! We need a bag! We need a bag. <laughs> she put one foot on Rollo to keep him in place. Bag! Bag! She screamed. Rollo kicked madly and bounced about under her shoe while Waif let go of him in order to bark. Rollo added to the din by yelling, Help! Murder! Assault! As a strong grating howl. In a strong grating howl. Peter, to do him justice, arrived at a run. He took one look at the scene in the doorway and snatched up one of Mrs. Baker's embroidered food bags, which he managed to get over Rollo's flailing legs. Before Carmen could draw breath to explain, ne next second... Peter had the bag entirely over Rollo and was holding it up, bulging, twisting, and dripping milk with milk. While he tried to reach on, reach one of his own pockets. Nice work, he said. Get some string out of the po out of that pocket, will you? We don't want him getting away. And when Carmen was fumbling out. A length of purple string from the pocket. He added, have you had breakfast? Good. Tie the top of the bag really tight. Then take it and hold it fast while I get ready. Then we can go straight there. <laughs> Uttered the bag as Peter passed it over. Shut up, Carmen said to it and hung on to it the bag with both hands just above the purple string. The bag twisted with this way and that. While Carmen watched, Peter dragged lops of colored string from pockets all over his coat. He put red string round his left thumb and green round his right and purple, yellow, and pink round his first three fingers of his right hand followed by a by black, white, and blue round the first three fingers on his left hand. Waif stood on the doorstep, frayed ears crocked, staring up at the process with interest. Are we going to find the end of the rainbow or something? Carmen asked. No, but this is how I've memorized the way to the kobolds, Peter explained. Right, shut the front door. Let's go, shouted the bag, 
And the same to you, Peter said, leading the way to the inner door. Waif trotted after and Carmen followed with the writhing bag. They turned right through the door. Carmen was too preoccupied to say she thought that was the way to the conference room. She was remembering how easily all the kobolds had vanished and reappeared and how Rollo himself had sunk into the earth of the mountain meadow. It seemed to her that it was only a matter of time before Rollo sank out of the bottom of the embroidered bag. She kept one hand underneath it and she was sure that was not enough. With milk dripping between her fingers, she tried to keep Rollo in with a spell. The trouble was she had no idea how to do this. The only thing she could think of was the use the way was to use the way she had dealt with Peter's leaking pipe spells. Stay inside! Stay inside! She thought at Rollo, massaging the bottom of the bag. Each massage produced another muffled yell from the bag which made her sh sure that rollo was get wasn't which made her sure that rollo was getting away she had simply followed peter as he turned this way and that and never noticed how you got to the kobolds at all she only noticed when they were there they were standing outside a large well-lit cave full of little blue people rushing about it was hard to see what most of them were doing because the view was partially blocked by the very strange object in the entrance this object looked a little like one of the horse-drawn sleds that people used in high Nordland when the winter snows came and made it impossible to use the cart or carriage except that this thing had no way to hitch a horse onto it. It had a huge curvy handle and at the back instead of at the back instead and had curls and curvy bits all over it. Dozens of kobolds were working at it, climbing this way and that over it as they worked. Some were lining the inside with padding and sheepskin. Some were hammering and carving, and the rest were painting the outside with curly blue flowers on a gold background. It was going to be very magnificent when it was finished, whatever it was. Peter said to Carmen, Can I trust you to be polite this time? Can you remember to be tactful at least? I can try, Carmen said. It depends. Then let me do the talking, Peter told her. He tapped the nearest busy kobold on the back. Excuse me, can you tell me where I can find Tim... Tim... Timmins? Timmins, I believe. That's what it says. Halfway down the cave, the kobold piped, pointing with the, her paintbrush. Working on the cuckoo clock. What do you want him for? We have something very important to tell him, Peter said. This attracted the attention of most of the kobolds working on the object. Some of them were turned and looked apprehensively at Waif. Waif at once looked sp spry sprightly at them, I guess, sprightly at them, demure and lovable. The rest start, stared at Carmen, and the withering embroidered bag. Who have you got there? One of them asked. Rollo, said Carmen. Most of them nodded without seeming at all surprised. When Peter asked, is it all right to go and speak to Tim Timmins? They all nodded again and told him, go ahead. Carmen got the feeling that nobody liked Rollo very much. Rollo seemed to know this because he stopped writhing and made no kind of noise while Peter 
edged his way past the strange object and Carvin came after him holding the bag sideways so as to not get paint on it. What are you making? She asked the nearest kobolds as she went. Commission from the elves, one of them answered. Another added, going to cost a lot. And a third said, elves always pay well. Carmen came out into the cave feeling none the wiser. The place was huge and there were teeny kobold children tearing about among the busy adults. Most of the children screamed and ran away when they saw Waif. Their parents mostly moved prudently round to the back of whatever they were working on and went on painting, polishing, or carving. Peter led the way past the rocking horses, doll houses, baby chairs, grandfather clocks, wooden settles, and wind-up wooden dolls until they came to the cuckoo clock. It was unmistakable. It was enormous. It was a giant wooden casing stretched all the way up to the magically lighted roof. It was huge clock it was its huge clock face was propped up separately, filling most of the walls beside the casing. And the and the cuckoo for it, which a score of kobolds were de, delight diligently covering with feathers was rather larger than Carmen and Peter together. Carmen wondered whoever might want a cuckoo clock that big. Timmins was climbing about in the mass in the massive cl clockwork with a teeny spanner. There he is, Peter said, recognizing him by his nose. Peter went up to the to the giant works and cleared his throat. Excuse me. <clears throat> Excuse me. Timmins swung himself round a mighty coil of metal and glowered at him. Oh, it's you, he eyed the bag. Kidnapping people now, are you? Rollo must have heard Timmins' voice and f felt he was among friends. <laughs> the bag bellowed. That's Rollo. Timmins said accusingly. That's right, Peter said. We've brought him here to confess to you. The Lubbock on the mountain paid him to make trouble between you and Wizard Norland. <laughs> the bag shouted. But Timmins had gone silvery blue with horror. The Lubbock? He said. That's right, said Peter. We saw him yesterday asking the Lubbock for his reward. And the Lubbock gave him the crock of gold from the end of the rainbow. <laughs> Denied the bag loudly. Both of us saw it, Peter said. Let him out, Timmins said. Let him speak. Peter nodded at Carmen. She took her hand away from the bottom of the bag and stopped doing, doing what she hoped was her spell. Rollo instantly fell through the floor and... To, fell onto the floor where he had spitting out milky ends of embroidery wool and old crumbs and glaring at Peter. I really did some magic. I kept him in there, Carmen thought. You see what they're like, Rollo said angrily. Bag up a person. Fill his mouth with stale fuzz so that he can't answer back while they tell lies about him? You can answer now, Timmins said. Did you get a crock of gold from the Lubbock for setting us at odds with the wizard? How could I have done? Rollo asked vir um, virtuously. No kobold would ever seen dead talking to a Lubbock. You know, I... You know that. Quite a crowd of kobolds had gathered around by now at the safe distance from Wave and Rollo waved dramatically arm dramatically waved arms everywhere. Bear witnesses Bear witness, he said. I'm a victim of a pack of lies. 
Go and search his grotto, some of you. Go and search his grotto, some of you, Timmins ordered. Several kobolds set off at once. Rollo jumped to his feet. I'll go with you, he cried out. I'll prove there's nothing there. Rollo had gone three steps when Waif seized him by the back of his blue jacket and bumped him to the floor again. She stayed there, teeth in Rollo's jacket, frayed tail wagging, with one ear crooked forward, Carmen as if to say, didn't I do well? You did wonderfully well, Carmen told her. Good dog. Rollo shouted, Call it off! It's hurting my back! No, you can stay there until they come back They're from searching your grotto, Carmen said. Rollo folded his arms and sat looking righteous and sulky. Carmen turned to Timmins. Is it all right to ask you who wants such a big clock while we wait? She, she, she explained seeing Peter shaking his head at her. Timmins looked up at the vast piece of clock. Crown Prince Ludovic, he said with a gloomy sort of pride. He wanted a whopper for a cas for Castle um, Josie. Gloom swallowed up his pride. He hasn't paid us a penny yet. He never does pay. When you think how rich he is... He was interrupted by the kobolds coming back at a run. Here it is, they shouted. It is this it? It was under his bed. The kobold in front was carrying the crock in both arms. It looked like an ordinary clay pottery clock. crock. The kind someone might use to make a stew in an oven. Ex except that it had a sort of glow around it and in a faint and in faint rainbow colors that's the one peter said then what do you think he did with the gold the kobolds asked what do you mean what did i do with the gold rollo demanded that was that there pot was stuffed full he st stopped realizing he was giving himself away it isn't now. Take a look if you don't believe me, the other kobold retorted. He dumped the crock down between Rollo's outstretched legs. This, this is just how we found it. Rollo bent into, to, bent to look inside the pot. He uttered a cry of grief. He plunged his hand into it and brought out a handful of dry yellow leaves. Then he brought out another handful and another, until he and both hands inside the empty crock, and was sitting surrounded by dead leaves. It's gone, he howled. It charred into dead leaves. The Lubbock cheated me. So you admit the Lubbock paid you to make trouble, Timmins said. Rollo scowled up sideways at Timmins. I don't admit to anything except that I have been robbed. Peter coughed. <clears throat> I'm afraid the Lubbock cheated him worse than that. It's laid its eggs in him as soon as his back was churned. There was a gasp from all around. Big-nosed, cobalt faces stared at Rollo, pale blue in horror. Noses and all. And turned to Peter. It's true. We both saw it, Peter said. Carmen nodded. They turned to her. True, she said. It's a lie, Rollo howled. They're pulling, you're pulling my leg. No, we are not, Carmen said. The Lubbock stuck out its egg-laying prong and got you in the back just before you went down into the earth. Didn't, didn't you say just now that you, your back hurt? Rolo's eyes popped at Carmen. He believed her. His mouth opened. Waif scrambled hastily away as he began to scream. He threw the pot aside. He drummed his heels 
in a storm of dry leaves and yelled until his face was navy blue. I'm a goner, he blubbered. I'm walking dead. There's things breeding inside of me. Help, oh, please help me, somebody. <laughs> Nobody helped him. All the kobolds backed away, still staring in horror. Peter looked disgusted. One lady kobold said, What a disgraceful display. And this seemed so unfair to Carmen that she could not help feeling truly sorry for Rollo. The elves can help him, she said to Tibbins. What did you say? Tibbins snapped his fingers. There was a sudden silence, although Rollo continued to drum his heels and to open and shut his mouth, nobody could hear a noise. What did you say? Tibbins said to Carmen. The elves, Carmen said. They know how to get Lubbock eggs out of a person. Yes, they do, Peter agreed. Wizard Nordman had Lubbock eggs laid in him. That was why they took him away to cure him. An elf came yesterday with the eggs they'd taken out of him. Elves charge high, remarked a kobold by Carmen's right knee, sounding rather impressed. I think the king paid, Carmen said. Hush! Timmin's brow was wrinkled right down to his nose. He sighed. I suppose, he said, we can give the elves their sled chair for nothing in exchange for them curing Rollo. Curses! That's two commissions we won't get paid for. Put Rollo to bed, some of you, and I'll t talk to the elves. And I warn all of you again not to go near that meadow. Oh, that's all. All right now, Peter said cheerfully. The Lubbock's dead. The fire demon killed it. What? shrieked all the kobolds. Dead? They clamored. Really? You mean the fire demon that's visiting the king? Did he actually kill it? Yes, really, Peter shouted through the noise. He killed the Lubbock. And then he destroyed the eggs and the, the elf brought. And we think he destroyed himself too, Carmen added. She was fairly sure none of the kobolds heard her. They were all too busy dancing, cheering, and throwing their small blue hats into the air. When the noise had died down a bit and four sturdy kobolds had carried Rollo away, still Soundlessly kicking and screaming, Timon said sincerely to Peter, That Lubbock kept us all in fear, in being that in being the parent of the crown prince and all. What can we give the fire demon to show our gratitude, do you think? Put Wizard Nordland's kitchen taps back, Peter said promptly. That said Timmons goes without saying. It was Rollo's doing that they were taken away. I meant, what can mere kobolds do for a fire demon that it cannot do for itself? I know, Carmen said. Everyone was respectfully quiet. She went on. Calcifer and his er, family were trying to find out where all the king's money keeps disappearing to. Can you help them do that? There were murmurs around Carmen's knees of easy that is and that's no problem and quite a ripple of laughter as if Carmen had asked a stupid question. Timmins was so relieved that his brow unwrinkled entirely making his nose and his whole face twice as long. That that is easy to do he said and costs nothing. He glanced across to the other side of the cave where at least 60 cuckoo clocks hung, all wagging their pendulums in 60 different rhythms. If you come with me now, I think we should just be in time to see the money going. Are you sure the fire demon would be pleased by this? Absolutely, Carmen said. Then follow me, please, Timon said. He led the way toward the back of the cave wherever they were going to turn turned out to be quite a long walk 
Kyra became as confused as she had been on the way to the kobold's cave. They were in half dark the whole distance, and the route seemed to all be all bends and sharp churns and hairpins, corners ever, every so often. Timmins would say, three short steps and a right churn, or count eight human step sizes and churn left, then sharp right, then left again. And this went on for so long that Waif became tired out and whined to be picked up. Carmen carried her for what seemed to be more than half the way. I must explain that the co- in that the kobolds here belong to a different clan, Timon said, when at, le- at last there seemed to be a little daylight ahead. I like to think that my clan would have managed better than they do. Then, before Carmen could ask what he meant, he went into a flurry of sharp rights and slow lefts, with a couple of zigzags thrown in, and she went found, and she found they were at the end of the underground passage in cool green daylight. Marble steps all greened over with mildew led up to into some bushes. The bushes must have once have been planted on either side of the steps, but they had grown to fill the space entirely. Waif began to growl, sounding like a dog twice her size. Hush, Timmins whispered. No noise at all from here onward. Waif stopped growling at once, but Carmen could feel her small hot body throbbing with hitting growls. Carmen turned to Peter to make sure he had the sense to keep quiet too. Peter was not there. There was only herself at Waif and Timmins. Carmen, wholly exasperated, knew just what had happened. Somewhere along the confusing way, when Timmins had said turn left, Peter had turned right, or the other way around. Carmen had no idea what had happened at this point, but she knew it had. Never mind, she thought. He has enough colored strings round his fingers to find his way to in gray and back. He'll probably arrive at Great Uncle William's house before long, before I do. So she forgot about Peter and concentrated on tiptoeing up the slippery, mildewy steps and then on peering out from among the bushes without rustling so much as one leaf. There was a blazing sunlight beyond on blazing a very green, very beautifully kept grass with a blindingly white garden path beyond that. The path led up between trees that had been carved into knobs and points and cones and discs like a lesson in geometry to a small storybook palace, one that had many small pointed towers with little with little blue roofs. Carmen recognized it was Castle Host, um, Josie where Crown Prince Ludwig lived. She was slightly ashamed to realize that it was the building she always thought of when she looked, when any book she was reading mentioned a palace. I must have been very unimaginative, she thought. Then no. Whenever her father made shortbreads to sell in boxes for May Day, a picture of Castle Josie always appeared on the top of the box. Castle Josie was, after all, the pride of High Nordland. No wonder it was so far to walk, she thought. We must be halfway down the Nordland Valley here. And it still is my idea of the perfect palace. So there. Footsteps crunched on the hot white path, and Prince Ludovic himself appeared in magnificent white and azure skill. 
silk. Oh gosh, I can't read. Soldering toward the palace just before he was level with the bush where Carmen was. He stopped and turned. Come along, can't you? He said angrily. Get a move on. We're trying, your highness, piped a small panting voice. A line of kobolds trudging into view, each bowed down under a knobby leather sack. They were all more grayish green than blue and looked most unhappy. Some of the unhappiness may have been due to the sunlight, for kobolds preferred to live in the dark, but Carmen thought their color looked more like bad health. Their legs wobbled. One or two were coughing badly. The last one in the row was so unwell that he stumbled and fell down, dropping his sack, which spilled a scatter of gold coins across the blazing white path. At this, the colorless gentleman strode into view. He advanced on a fallen kobold and started kicking him. He did not kick particularly hard, nor did he look particularly cruel. It was more as if he was trying to get a machine going again. The kobold scrambled about under the kicks, desperately picking up gold coins until he had them all back in the sack and managed to stagger to his feet again. The colorless gentleman left off kicking him and came to stroll beside Prince Ludovic. It's not as if it was even a heavy load, he said to the prince. It's probably the last. They've no more money left unless the king sells his books. Prince Ludovic laughed. He'd rather die than do that, which suits me, of course. We'll have to think of some other way to get the money then. Castle Josie is so dashed expensive to run. He looked back and trudged at the trudging wobbling kobolds move along move along there will you i have to get back to the royal mansion for tea the colorless gentleman nodded and strode back to the kobolds ready to start kicking again the prince waited for him, saying, Mind you, if I never see another crumpet in my life, it will be too soon for me. The kobolds saw the colorless gentleman coming and did their best to hurry. All the same, it seemed an age to Carmen until the procession was out of sight and she could no longer hear the footsteps crunching. She kept her arms tight round the throbbing Waif, who seemed to want to jump down and chase the procession and look down through at leaves at Timson. Why haven't you told anyone about this before? Why didn't you at least tell Wizard Nordlin? Nobody asked, Timson said, looking injured. No, of course nobody asked, Carmen thought. This was why Rollo was paid to make the kobolds angry with great uncle William. He'd half got round to asking him in the end if he hadn't been ill. He thought it was just as well as the Lubbock was dead. If the prince, if it was Prince Ludovic's parents, as Timson had said, then it probably meant to kill the crown prince and rule the country instead of him. It had more or less told her so, after all, but that still leaves Prince Ludovic to deal with, he thought. I mean, she thought, I really have to tell the king about him. It seems a bit hard on the col on those kobolds, he said. She said to Timson. It is, Timson agreed, but they have not asked for help yet. And of course, it never occurred to you to help them without being asked, did it? Carmen thought. Honestly, I give up. Can you show me the way home? She asked. 
Timson hem- hesitated. Do you think the fire demon will be glad to know the, the money goes to Castle Josie? Yes. Or at least his family will, Carmen said. And that is the end of chapter 14. I hope you guys have enjoyed this reading and I will see you for the next chapter.